Balaclava, Waterloo, the Somme, the Boer War, Gallipoli, the India Mutiny. From Alamein to the Zulu War, Scottish regiments have fought Britain's battles and, for better or worse, shaped our world. Regimental history and traditions are more than mere sentiment. They're powerful weapons in the arsenal of Scotland's regiments, no more so than in the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. When they first join up, uh, it doesn't mean a lot, but very quickly they get brought into the family, they get to see where the traditions come from, where, where the, the, the regiment's a very, not only a family regiment, it's, it's also a very localised regiment. They all come from the same area, so very quickly they sort of form a, a good bond. They serve together, they drink together, they fight together when it's required. I mean, we've had fathers, sons, brothers all serving in the regiment, all at the same time, telling about war stories, etc., etc., amongst themselves. But, but these war stories are, are what sort of good Argyles are made of. They are a part of history. You just have to look at the painting of the thin red line, and if you look at the, the, the faces along it, I mean, they could be faces of a jock at Balaclava, they could be a jock today. The, the names may change, but the, the faces are the same. One of them faces could come straight off the pitch of the thin red line and could be standing with a shield at the front of the Holy Cross quite easily. The Sutherland Highlanders, the 93rd of foot, was first recruited from the Sutherland Estates in 1799. Enlistment was not voluntary. Tenants were gathered together, inspected by a general, and snuff offered to every man picked for service. The contract was sealed with a dram. Surgeon William Munro wrote an account of his years with the regiment. In 1850 to 51, there were so many Highlanders in the ranks who could not speak and did not understand English that the Secretary of State for War sanctioned fourpence a day extra to pay four corporals to drill these men and explained to them in Gaelic the English words of command. Front rank only. Fire! Dünkirchen, vom Gegner hartnäckig verteidigt, wird besetzt. Stadt und Hafen bieten ein Bild... As late as World War II, there was Gaelic spoken in the regiment. And soldiers escaped capture by speaking in Gaelic and persuading the Germans they were Siberians. After the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion, the government in London had viewed Highlanders as traitors and savages. But within decades, Highland regiments had won Britain's acclaim as staunch and fearless soldiers of the empire. Highlanders flocked to the colours. Today's regiment is an amalgamation of two ancient units. The other was the 91st Regiment, the Argyles, raised for the Duke of Argyle in 1794. While 17 of the officers were Argyle Campbells, the regiment was forced to look to the lowlands to swell the ranks. Today, the regiment still draws from both traditional recruiting grounds. Squad, well advanced. Ride, town. Squad, well retire. He bent. Tom! Squad, well advanced. Ride! Tom! Squad, stand at ease. I like passing on the wee bit of skill I've got to, to the cadets. I think kids are getting fed up sitting playing games. And they, they, they want to get back out. And you look at Scotland, Scotland just one adven big adventure playground. But the British Army has exploited that for years. They've been taking Scotsmen from all over Argyllshire for hundreds of years into the British Army. When I went to the Primorse Secondary School in Iowa, I joined the Army Cadet Force there. I mean, it, it focused me on joining the Army. I always wanted to join the Army after being in the cadets. From 1990, I've been here every year, either a six-month tour and currently, obviously, on the two-month tour. <laughs> I 
us being our girls, I think we've actually got one up most other regiments because when they see the Glengarry's and over Scottish, and there's actually quite a lot in common with the people in Northern Ireland, and um, we got on quite well with them. Um, obviously, some days they hate bad days and they don't like us, and some days they do. It's just part of life. Okay, pick up the shields. A pre deployment check before A Company goes on duty at a sectarian hotspot in Belfast. Quite a frustrating country. You're, kind of, you're sitting in the middle of the fence, really, not knowing who's your enemy, who's your friend. There are still pockets in Northern Ireland, and North Belfast is one of them, where uh, emotions and feelings. Uh, run extremely deep and uh, we've seen the manifestation of that in things like uh, the Holy Cross Primary School issue on the Ardoin Road. With our girls was my local regiment, me coming from Denny in Stirlingshire and there wasn't a lot of jobs to offer um, in Denny and the army seemed a quite a well paying job at the time and a chance to travel the world. Men of the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders are seen about to board their plane. I've been to Kenya, Germany, Poland, obviously here. I've been to most countries in Europe. Um, we're in Denny, I think I might have been labouring to a bricklayer for £125 a week. I think the traditions of any regiment are, in a way, the glue that bind us all together. They are what give us a common identity. And I think they are as relevant now as they've ever been. The regiment's finest hour was in 1854, during the Crimean War, a British, French and Turkish campaign against Russian imperial ambition. The Sutherland Highlanders formed the original Thin Red Line at the Battle of Balaclava, repulsing the Russian cavalry. The phrase Thin Red Line was coined by the first ever newspaper war correspondent, W.H. Russell of The Times. As the Russian cavalry in one grand line charged towards Balaclava, the ground flew beneath their horses' feet. Gathering speed at every stride, they dashed on towards that thin red streak tipped with a line of steel. Ere they came within 250 yards, a volley flashed from the rifles. The Russians wheeled about and fled faster than they came. Bravo, Highlanders! Well done! shouted the excited spectators. These are the instruments used on the battlefield by the 93rd surgeon, William Munro. The position of the surgeon on the day of battle is a trying one. He has not the excitement of the fight, but is exposed to the same danger as his comrades. He has a cheering expectation of being able to save life, but when the lifeless body of a comrade is laid on the ground before him, his feelings are almost akin to despair. Regiments like the 93rd had been the product of a clan society where feudal lords raised regiments from their own tenants. But the Highlands were changing. When the Duke of Sutherland had gone to Golspie in 1854 to raise more men for Crimea, he was told, Should the Tsar of Russia take possession of Dunrobin Castle next term, we couldn't expect worse treatment at his hands than we have experienced at the hands of your family for the last 50 years. We have no country to fight for. You robbed us of our country and gave it to sheep. Therefore, since you prefer sheep to men, let sheep defend you. But while some Highlanders were reluctant to serve in Crimea, four wives campaigned with the Southern Highlanders there. Mrs Ross, wife of Private and later Sergeant Alexander Ross, and laundress to the regiment's commander, later told a Scottish newspaper of her experiences of balaclava. I was there all the time. So were Mrs Smith and Mrs Allison. We were on number four battery. The 93rd were forming the thin red line. I saw my husband in the front rank. The Turks were on a battery higher up, nearer the Russian lines. As the Russians advanced, the Turks fled from their battery and crying, ship, 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 came running into our men's camp. The Turks thought the Kilties were women. As the British could not fight themselves, they had sent out their women. When the Turks came flying down, Mrs. Smith 
got hold of a big stick and laid about them with it. She gave a pasha one or two blows over the head. You blackguard, she cried. Would you leave my regiment to be cut up? Mrs. Smith was an Irish woman and a plucky one. <laughs> The long-awaited moment had last arrived, and mothers, wives, and sweethearts were reunited with their menfolk. These are Argyles returning home from a war a century later. Crimea had left too many destitute widows. After Balaclava, British army wives stayed at home when their men went to war. Over there is poor Mrs. M, sitting on her husband's grave. That bundle of dirty, wet blanket contains a living creature, once a comely, useful soldier's wife, now waiting for death to release her from her misery. Standing orders for 1834 show that married women were treated as little more than regimental servants. The soldier's wives who have permission to be with the regiment are to be equally distributed among the companies, whose washing, etc., is to be given to them. Today, women enjoy more challenging roles. I'm a physical training corps instructor for the Argyles, and I'm responsible for um, getting them up to fitness standard and maintaining it. One go one side. I was actually selected to come to the Argyles. I had three years with them, and it's been an education, and I've enjoyed it. I joined the Army Physical Training Corps in '92, and I've had postings to training units and the School of PT. Um, now I've achieved serving with an infantry battalion, um, which to me is one of the best jobs that you can do in you know, the Army Physical Training Corps, um, and it's been great. There's not many jobs in the Army that a woman can't do, and it'll not be long before we're an equal and we're treated like an equal. Ballet, quick, march! In 1857, units of the Indian Army rebelled against its British Imperial master. Surgeon Munro, like many of the 93rd a veteran of Balaclava, used the purplest of prose to describe the Highlanders as they prepared to attack the rebel forces laying siege to the British garrison in Lucknow. In the whole British army, aye, or in any other army in the world, there were not 800 veterans as these. The light, crisp hair, well-cut prominent features and clear blue-grey eyes told of their Celtic origin. The westering sun flashed and glimmered along the mass of polished bayonets and brightened up the varied colours of their tartan kilts. The regiment won six Victoria Crosses in a single day at Lucknow. But the Indian mutiny was a tragic and bloody chapter in the history of the Empire. William Forbes Mitchell's account of his time with the regiment is a vivid and compassionate account of the struggle. He describes the scene at Cawnpore after the mutineers' massacre of European women and children. The floors of the room were still covered in congealed blood, littered with trampled, torn dresses of women and children, shoes, slippers, and locks of hair, many of which had evidently been severed from the living scalps by sword cuts. An iron hook fixed to the wall was covered in dried blood. It was evident that a little child had been hung onto it with his face to the wall, where the poor thing must have struggled for long, perhaps in the sight of its helpless mother. He also describes Britain's punishment for those thought guilty of the massacre. All prisoners found guilty were taken down into the slaughterhouse and there to be made to crouch down and with their mouths lick clean a square foot of the blood-soaked floor before being taken off to the 
gallows and hanged. The army had a strict hierarchy and class structure, but it was possible for a private soldier to work his way through the ranks. William McBean, a straight-talking Highland plowman, held every rank from private to major general, and won a VC at Lucknow when he single-handedly killed 11 mutineers with this sword. It only took me 20 minutes. I was there to kill, and I did my best in that way. More recently, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Brown also made a rapid rise through the ranks. He joined as a bandsman, but the 1941 German invasion of Crete changed his life. As a full sergeant at the end of 40, as a CQMS in 41, as a sergeant major at the end of 41, I was an RQMS in 42, and I was a lieutenant quartermaster in January 44. So I went through the lot. That's lucky. I survived and other people didn't. And then in Crete, you see, we left 350 of the battalion there as prisoners. And a lot of them were senior ranks. So really, uh, looking back, Crete has been a very important 10 days of my life. I um, got off Crete and uh, other people didn't. The Argyles and the Sutherland Highlanders amalgamated in 1881. The new regiment, usually dubbed the Argyles, was prominent in World War I. Private Jim Collins wrote to his parents before going over the top. Dear Mum and Dad, we're going into the trenches and I think there'll be a bayonet attack. That's the game at which we lose so many men, and so we can't all expect to come out of it. But it is a glorious death to die fighting for your king and country. The sting of death is, I think, hardly noticeable, as one is mad during the attack. It's my sincerest wish that I survive for your sake. I hope this will eventually reach you, should the worst occur. I will close your loving son, Jim. Jim Collins died of wounds. He was 18. The Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders and their territorial battalions saw some of the fiercest fighting and won six Victoria Crosses in the war to end all wars. Then, in September 1939, the Second World War saw the Argyles fight on many fronts. But one of the most dramatic and disastrous chapters of the regiment's history was when the 2nd Battalion, uniquely trained for jungle warfare, was caught up in the fight for the Far East. It's supposed to be kept seeing that the Japanese, they can't see, they've all got glasses and they can't see above, in front of their nose and all this sort of thing. And they've got inferior weapons to us. It uh, never occurred to want to do, do any, any of the troops that we'd be defeated. We, we were so aggressive uh, in our movements and our, our, our minds as well. We were determined at all costs that we were going to defeat the enemy, regardless of the weaponry that, that we had. And defeat by the, the Japanese uh, never entered our heads. Men of the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders preparing for battle in the Malay Peninsula. The CEO. They uh, had us in the jungle, jungle training all the time. The newspapers called us the jungle beasts. That's true, and he trained us thoroughly. He was a great CEO, though. Great, the men would have followed him to hell and back. We got filleted by the Japanese at a place called Slim River. At six o'clock in the morning, the Japanese came right through uh, non-stop. There was nothing nothing to hold them back. The next thing, the tanks come down the road. Oh, they were coming from all angles, you know, through the, the, the rubber plantation and down the main road and that. And they'd say that tanks could not be used 
Well, we never had any tanks anyway, and armoured cars, but uh, they, they just went in action. They were just blittered apart as soon as they tried to go up against a tank. Hopeless. The equipment that the Japanese had was far, far superior to anything we had. We have America to thank for these fine aircraft, which are a great contribution to the strength of the RAF in this area. The planes, we had Brewster Buffaloes. You can have passed a Brewster Buffalo on a bicycle. <laughs> they were that slow. They were just going up, and they were only two or three minutes up, and then Japanese shot them down. Singapore fell on the 15th of February, eh, and it, the 19th of May, before I was finally d taken prisoner. Eh, and even then, we didn't know that Singapore had capitulated. We thought eh, Singapore was still fighting. The Japanese came to us and said, uh, all men go to Thailand. So we, we got onto a train, and there must have been about 25 or 30 in, in that area, with the sun beating down. And it's like a dog being locked in a car. And it's a day here in, in August, you've got no chance. Uh, and it's a wonder that any of us uh, survived at the far end, Summers did. And that was our introduction to the Burma Railway. And at Tamarkan, we started building the bridge over the River Kwai. Chaps would say, ah, oh, what's the use? I'm fed up with this and why the... And they would be dead the next morning. They said they were going to die, and they would, they would be dead. And uh, I remember one hut we were in, and this hut keeps you in every night, and he kept doing it all night. Give a bit of rope, I want to hang myself. Well, somebody give me a bit of rope, I want to hang myself. And this went on night after night. And she used to stay clumsy. Well, somebody give him a bit of bloody rope to hang himself. <laughs> so somebody finally gave him a bit, and he did hang himself. During the time I was in captivity, I suffered with amoebic dysentery, bacillary dysentery, hookworm, and malaria every fortnight, dry beriberi, which paralyzed me, and to main poisoning, and ulcerated legs, which I managed to cure uh, by using uh, maggots. We prayed hard. Just to pray as says, please God, don't let us die in this God-forsaken hole. Get us home to Scotland and we'll die. You know, we'll gladly die in Scotland, but not in this God-forsaken hole. Here is stark evidence of the condition of some of these men. Just brutal starvation. Well, I actually look at it, and my wee pal's the same as me. He said, uh, if there is a heaven and hell, we've had our spell in hell. Well, I've been trying for 60 years to forget the past. It is an impossibility. Uh, it's only about six years ago that I stopped having nightmares. Uh, I'm all right in that respect now. And I never spoke about it. But now I'm slightly in a position where I can mention it, but I don't go into great detail, and I don't like to. I like to forget. And as we in our battalion have a motto, and that is ne oblivus caris, and that is lest you forget. In the late 20th century, media coverage began to have an impact on the actions of armies. 
It was now possible for people at home to see what was happening and ask questions about operations being undertaken in their name. We'll go down to the civil police station. Go to see Mohammed Ayn. In 1967, the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Colin Mitchell, caught the attention of the media in recording events as they unfolded in the former colony of Aden, where power was being transferred to a local government amidst a virtual civil war between liberating factions. We knew that in the town of Crater, there was enemy, but 50% of them weren't enemy. So you had to sort of sort that out, and of course we got that sorted out in the first couple of days we were there, when, uh, when the police rioted. The police mutinied when seven Arab school children were killed when their school bus was blown up by a landmine. Jake Much was on patrol that day, but was ordered back to barracks on an errand. And by the time I walked back to the, to the barracks, which is only about 200 metres, all 11 men on the Land Rovers were dead. All of them. The police had just let them in, come down as usual, and then when they were close enough, just sprayed them with ammunition, with uh, rifles in them and their machine guns. Terrible. I have no compunction in saying that if some chap now starts throwing grenades or using pistols, we shall kill him. Quite rightly. Colonel Mitchell commanded an operation to regain control of the town of Crater. He was what you call a, a jocks man, you know. He was very well liked. He wouldn't ask anybody to do anything that he was not prepared to do himself. A good man, a good man. And everybody, everybody liked him. The only thing he did, if, if he did anything foolish, uh, which even a simple soldier like I can summarize, he, uh, when, when he eventually went into Crater, he went in <laughs> the old fashioned way, you know, the piper in the front and him at the back. But the thing is, if a sniper took him out, then that has been a family without a mother, if you know what I mean, no commanding officer. But however, he got away with it and, and, it, and it worked, it worked. The fame Mad Mitch and the Argyles won at Crater was an effective weapon in the late 60s battle to save the regiment from disbandment. Today, their future seems assured. In March 2003, we go to become uh, an infantry battalion in the Army's brand new 16 Air Assault Brigade. Uh, and that will give us a, uh, the possibility of worldwide deployment, depending where our political masters want to send us. The spearhead of the infantry, first to go, yeah. Brilliant job, excellent. We'll travel all over the world. Any hotspot that occurs anywhere, we will obviously be first to go on task, which the battalion is thoroughly looking forward to doing. It's the front line, good stuff for the other guys.